Hello everyone and welcome back. Well, here's the box and if you haven't seen part one, um, part one is where we turned the equivalent of a shoebox into this project. Um, if you look down in that corner of the video, there's probably a little grey V. Within that description box, I will put a link to the first video and in the first video, I'll put a link to this video. So hopefully it'll all work fine. Okay. And um, this is the exciting bit now, making this come to life, giving this some details some color and making it that vintage look we're all sort of looking for. Now, this is a process of many stages because you need to build up many layers. So we'll be doing this in segments and then I'll be pausing you while it dries because I can't rush some of the drying process. So let's see. We've got our plain box now. You've seen this enough now, so I'll put that to one side. I am now going to take some acrylic paints. These are just regular shop bought acrylic paints, and I'm putting them. I'm putting them on this ceramic ceramic tile because that's just the way I like to work. Um, you can obviously put it on a paint palette. You can do what you want. I'm leaving my paints with the lids open because I know that I'm going to go through quite a bit of paint. We oh, need to shake that first quite a bit of paint so I'm probably not going to have enough on the palette and I'll add more as I go along. If I had that paint goober off there that would be a good idea. Um, it's also a good idea to have a damp cloth by um, to wipe up anything and also kitchen towel, kitchen paper and I'm using wet wipes. Whichever brand you wish I use wet wipes. Um, I'll explain my colour choices in a second. I just want to get these out so I can get going. Um, because there are reasons I've chosen these colours and they may not be an obvious reason to you um, and you may want to choose a different colour scheme and you can make this whatever you wish from here on in it, the world is your oyster as far as colouring goes okay so I've chosen these colours because I'm adding them with a wet wipe they're going to be a lot less intense than they are on there let's move that up a bit so it's out of my way a bit so they're a lot less than they are when they're on the box I'm looking to make the box look almost like coffee dyed or yellowed which was where those three come in um, these are on there to start the process of the look of corrosion because eventually I'm going to be using some gilding wax on here. There's texture paste going to be on here. There's going to be some stenciling on here. And that will hint at a bit of corrosion within there. So the process is, I don't normally do the bottom. Although if I'm cleaning off my wet wipe, I sometimes wipe it onto the bottom. But the only time the bottom is going to be seen is if you turn the box over or you drop the box. So in my opinion, I'll do, do to the edge, but I won't really do around the corner. My first thing is I usually take a bit of the brown and I just come in and I literally go all over. I've just given it a bit of a bit of a moment, should we call it, with the darker colour. I'm then going to come in with um, the yellowish colour, and I'm going to do this in patches. I don't want this to be the dominant colour. I'm just going to give it patches. Because now I'm changing to the blues and the greens, um, I'm going to change to a cleaner one. Now, here is where I sort of start to think corrosion. So when you look at a metal box, say this was a metal box, you would normally find corrosion would happen along the edges where water would collect or down the seams. So I do tend to go in a bit with this under, under that, that area there. And I'll also pull a little bit down the corners as well. Now, there's going to be stenciling, there's going to be spraying, there's going to be stuff over the top of this. So what you're putting on now may not always be seen. Oh, 
Right, so I've got the darker green on. I'm now going to come in with the lighter. I'm calling it green. It's almost like a teal colour. What were these? These were brown and a terracotta colour. This was, uh, what is it, school bus yellow. This was Bahama blue. And this was dark turquoise. They're just the colours I chose. I mean, there was no reason for them other than I like that colour. Now, the bits I'm putting on now with this lighter turquoise, or the Bahama Blue, as we've just discovered it's called, are literally, they're just the lighter sections. Like, when this is dried, I'm probably going to come in and maybe touch up with the odd patch of white as well, because without, without the light sections, the dark sections don't have any impact. So if and it'll it'll kind of make sense when you've seen the finished thing. You you do need to have light to be able to see shade. And again, I'm just going to give a little bit around here. Now at this point, it's almost finished as far as the first layer goes. But what I like to do is get rid of that cloth. Either save it for ephemera, um, whatever you wish. Now this time I'm going to do more of. A cleaning stuff off so now I'm going to take a bit of care and I'm going to wipe myself along here and all I'm doing is that paint has had a bit of time to dry I just want to lift some of it away I think we're okay this here I think there's just a little bit too much of the blue, so I'm going to pull a bit of that out. Now, this is working because I've got Mod Podge on my surface. So unless you've sealed your box in some way, as you work with it, you could potentially be pulling away um, the paper surface as well. So just be a little wary of that. I mean, as I said, I sealed it with Mod Podge. I know you could use... You could have used a matte medium for this and it would have sealed it as well. So, but I'm just doing what I normally do, guys. Just sharing with you what I did to create the original one. So, there you go. So that's, that's kind of my starting point. Now I'm going to pull in a little bit of white. And this is just white acrylic paint. I'm going to turn this around so I've got a cleaner spot. Just white acrylic paint. They can be tubes, they can be bottles, they can be whatever you wish it to be. Now I'm just going to come in, and as I said about light and shade, I now want to bring in some light. So I'm going to take my white, not a lot of it, and I just want to put the hint of it in certain areas. Just so that when I come to do stuff like, say I'm going to do some text stamping, which I am, am at some point, then it gives a nice background for that to be on. But I think the, the worst thing you can do is try and be methodical with sort of this sort of stuff. Um, if you're trying to only put it in certain places and plan this out, um, I don't actually think it works as well. I, I think just the randomness of this is, is the secret to it. And as I said, any section you don't like, just redo it. Just You can wipe it back off. You can put it back on. You can add an extra splash of the darker teal if you want, which is probably what I will do. I don't want to lose all of that dark teal, but I also don't want the dark teal currently to be dominant. So, come in little bits of white. Once I've finished this, I will, I will give you a bit of a better look at it. Hopefully, I'll be able to hold it up and turn it round. So let's just come in and put a little bit of the light on the inside too. Although we won't be doing any texturing on the inside. Uh, we won't be doing anything on the inside other than this, basically. Uh, purely because there's no need. It's That's where your ephemera is going to sit. I want to make sure that the ephemera is not going to get contaminated by anything you'll put on here. And also, if I've got um, texture paste or something on the inside and it actually dries... Um, like if I'm using a grit paste, then that could actually damage my ephemera when it goes in. But I don't want to leave the inside of these alcoves pristine because they then just don't look natural. Or they don't fit in with the rest of the design, should we say. 
Let's just wipe that out there. So, I think, have I done that one? I don't think I've done that one. I've probably done the same one twice now. I've been turning this box around. So, I will just take a little look now. Looking at these sides, do I want anything anywhere else? Um, I think I'd like a little more of the darker blue up there. So, I'm just going to take a bit of this or darker teal. And just put a little bit more dark teal. I have a tendency to like my corrosion in the top right hand corner. I don't know why. It's just the way the way I've always done it. So I'm just dabbing this bit on here just to just to start getting into the gaps and the crooks and crannies. So you don't have to do my way. You do whatever you wish. If anything, I would say um, it's sometimes really useful if you can find a picture of, say, corrosion or rust or something along those lines on the internet and actually use it as a reference point when you're trying to colour stuff. I tend to just wing it. I want a bit more of the dark in there. Um, I tend to just wing it and assume I know, but then I have seen quite a bit of corrosion images and through my photography I've taken quite a few rusty rusty images and stuff like that. So, so I'm used to seeing it and I think that's where I get to replicate it from. So, so I've just done that. So there you go. I've got a little bit more on there. I've got the paint there. I don't mind a little bit along the bottom edge because that's another place where corrosion would gather where um, moisture would have dripped down and gathered at the bottom of something. I do hope you can see all of this. I'm trying so hard to make sure it's all clear, but it just feel a little bit like the box is bigger than the both of us. Also what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same same dabbing effect and I'm going to take a little bit of the tan colour and just put a little bit of that on here as well. Just in the region, sorry can you see that, just in the region of where I've just put um, uh, the dark teal purely because I'm trying to give the idea that that section of the box has started to rust, therefore um, I've got, what am I trying to say, I've got the corrosion happening underneath it. Now some of this may get covered up in the final work and it may not get covered up, it's just, it is what it is. So, so, and you don't have to go overboard with it, remember you do not want this to be uniform. I'm doing the corners because the corners are where naturally the rust would be. I don't mind the odd patch here or there. I find a dabbing action for this is a lot more realistic than actually just wiping this on because I'm now trying to bring to the fore the illusion of age. <laughs> just look in the mirror, that's what I say to myself. Look in the mirror, Griffiths, you'll see age. So, joking aside. So. And I think this side probably just needs a little bit. Let's put there because I'm not sure where where metal works going to go on here. Actually, that's an idea. I'm going to have the nameplate at one of the ends. So maybe a little bit of putting the nameplate area as having a bit of rust around that area as well. Let's do it on the other end because I'm undecided. I will only decide where the nameplate goes or the file plate, so I'm going to call it from here on in probably. I won't decide where that goes until um, I see the finished box because then I'll choose my preferred, preferred end of the box. So there you go. So as I said, I'm not overly worried about the inside. This, let's move this out of the way so hopefully I can give you something to look at. So these are the sides as I've done them now. So this is just a combination of those, those teal colours, the yellows, the terracottas and browns. So I'm literally just trying to age the box um, to take it from the mundane to the lovely, to be honest with you. Now I have to let this dry. I mean, it won't take that long to dry. There's the bottom, as I said, I don't normally deal with the bottom. Um, there's the inside, not hugely decorated, but it's not going to be, it's not meant to be. So I don't mind, as long as the inside has got something in it and I pulled some of the outside colours onto the inside, I'm okay with it. So here I'm back again. It's been about 10 minutes and 
because this is only a thin coating of acrylic we put on there, it's dry enough for the next next layer of interest I want to put on. Now I pulled in two texture stamps, um, text stamps. These happen to be Tim Holtz. They can be any text stamp you want. In fact, they can be any stamp you want. They don't need to be words. They could be images, they could be butterflies, they could be, they, they can be anything you wish to be, whatever the character of the box is going to be. And I'm using archival because I need them to be permanent because I'm going to be using wet mediums on the box as well. So I'm just going to bring in my box. Let's see if I can get it. So it's almost, maybe I can do it this way. Okay, do that. You don't actually need to be seeing me push the stamp into the stamp block. So just so you can see, I do this without using an acrylic block and I will come in and I will literally just stamp in bits around um, the piece I'm working on. I also don't forget to do the top and it doesn't matter if things are done on the side. So I tend to work around with one stamp first of all and then I'll go around with the other. Now I'm using two stamps. You could just use one stamp. You could use no stamps. You could, if you're good at penmanship, you could even just go in and um, write messages on the side of the box for yourself. My handwriting is appalling, so you're not going to see me doing that. Um, also, try not to do the same thing on every single surface of the box. Um, you don't have to be uniform. The more random, the better. If you also want to do some of the stamping on the inside of the box, you could, but you're going to find it tricky. I tend to end up having to do it upside down, so I tend not to do it there. Just clean off my stamp. I don't mind cleaning the stamp off on the bottom. It's just a little bit of interest, so that's one of them done. Um, I'm then going to come in. I've got them in two different text sizes because it really adds interest that they're different. So... And again, you're going to find there may be crackle paste over the top of some of this. There may be texture paste. There may be grit paste. Um, there may be runs in ink. There may there could be anything over the top of these. So don't don't think you have to plan this out. This is literally interest upon interest upon interest visually. That's all I'm looking to do. Um, you could also, just be aware, you could um, put some tissue on here as well. Maybe you've got a, a tissue that's got script written onto it or um, rice paper or something. But do remember that if you're going to do that, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, that you are going to need to seal it in some way um, before we do some other ink and wet mediums on it. Right, that's all over, so I'm just going to clean this off on the bottom. So here we are back again. Um, this is where I want to start adding textures as in with texture paste now. Now I'm going to show you the paste I'm using, but only because they're what I used in the original. Use whatever you have to hand. So I'm using Galleria modeling paste. That's going to be through my stencil. I'm using, where is it? The Distress Grit Paste. That's going to be there to give me a bit of almost rust effect when it's eventually colored. And then I'm going to use um, textured opaque paste. I want to say this is Ranger as well. Yeah, this is Ranger as well. And this is the crackle paste. Now, word of warning about the crackle paste. The crackle paste will go on. It will crackle. Uh, but eventually, as you use the box, you may find one or two of the small flakes come off. And that's natural. And then eventually it'll just settle down. Um, but just know that that can sometimes happen. So my first thing is I want to pull in a couple of stencils. So I've just pulled in these two. Um, as you can see, this is an incredibly well-loved one. This is a Tim Holtz one, and I use it all the time for my mixed media and my stenciling onto gel plates, which is why it looks like this. And this is another one. I want to say this might have been designer stencils in the USA. I'm not sure. I've had it for years. Um, ironically, and I didn't know this till I picked it up, it actually fits perfectly into that gap. So I could use that as a feature piece somewhere. I'm more than likely just to use it on the ends or might use just part of it. Just look at sections of a stencil. You don't need to use all of it. Um, I don't know. I'm going to think about how I use that as I go along. So my first thing is I'm going to do stenciling. Now, stenciling 
it doesn't need to be perfect. I'm just going to open the top of this if I can. I will struggle with these. Oh. There you go. Got it. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect. Absolutely doesn't need to be perfect. The thing you do need to be aware is as you're stenciling and handling the box, remember if I'm working on this side, that side may be wet. So don't do that. You'll end up messing it up. We may have to work on an angle and I tend to handle the box by the inside and always lay it flat. So I'm going to come in, if I can pick up my stencil, and I'm going to put my first bit of stenciling in here. Doesn't matter which way round it is, it's completely up to you how you do it. Um, I quite like this swirl on here, so I'm just going to take some of my paste, I'm going to press down and then smooth across. As I said, don't think of it being perfect. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be on there. Eventually, um, we might be using something like, um, oh God, I forgot what it's called. Um, like a wax rub on, oh, what the heck is it? I'll, you'll find out when we get there. I can't think of the name at the moment. Um, gilding wax, that's what it's called. We'll be using metallic gilding wax but you could equally be using um, a metallic acrylic or a paint or a gel or anything. So just pop that on there. As you can see, that's lovely. Am I going to mess with it? No, I might run that down there just so I've got the edges of it. That's fine with me. Do I want it in another place? Um, do I want it in another place? I love this one, but I think I do want it on one of the end pieces because I'm not sure. Um, where the end of my box is going to be that I'm going to use. So I'm probably going to come in and put the same piece on there. So hopefully you're seeing this guys, as I said, a little bit tricky with the angles of the cameras, but hopefully we're doing the best we can. Again, try not to be uniform in the things you do. It, it won't pay you dividends. It will actually just look weird if it's so uniform. Right, I've done that bit. Again, I'm just going to clean off that edge and I'm going to put my box down. Now, as far as the paste that goes on here, I tend to wipe it off just so that it's off there. And then I will probably wash that stencil. But in the meantime, because obviously I'm doing the video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of those wet wipes and I'm just going to lay the wet wipe over it so that it doesn't start to dry out on me. Because once, once the paste is dry, it's going to be the devil's own job to get it off. Right, now we're going to focus on the other end and the other side. So this side. Now, do I want that in the middle? I don't think I do. But I don't mind it on the end. And I might actually be tempted to put it on either end. So come in again with a bit of paste. Now, if I go on to the other part of the design, I can always just scrape it off. Because everything underneath here is actually dried at the moment. So it's not going to smear the ink. It's not going to do anything like that. It's literally on there and that's the way it is. Lift that off. So any bits like this here, I can just scrape away. Any bits like the edge of that design can come away and any bits here can come away as well. So I'm not worried about this, guys. I think half of us get really tied up with things have to be perfect and believe me I am the worst at trying to make things perfect but in this in in the in this project it's easier if it's not perfect so I think I am going to put one at the other end as well if I can lift this up and all the time I'm resting the box on its base on the angle so that I'm not I'm not knocking the other side so you're not going to see this very well because my thumb has to hold it here. And unfortunately, that's directly in the light that you're trying to look and see what I'm doing with. But it'll only take me a second and I'll show you. Clean that off of there. That's my nail under there. So as you can see, I've just come in now. I'm just going to tidy up those bits there. Um, anything that you miss, don't worry, it just becomes extra texture. Right, so clean that off. Now, I've got that on one side. I've got that on the other side. I've got that on that side. Um, I'm giving myself options. So I'm wondering what I want here. And I'm wondering whether 
that might not look nice if I'm doing it downwards. I'm trying to find roughly the middle. Sorry guys, just need to play around with this. I've got it in the right place. That's roughly the middle. Okay, so I've got my thumb there holding it in place. Um, if you're worried about holding it in place, um, washi tape is great for doing that. Or you've also got masking tape. So if you've got any of that in your workshop, this is the time when it comes into its own. So just try to get up under my thumb. Not the easiest thing. So I thought that might just look a really nice feature on the front of this box if this becomes the front. So there you go. Now I'll just get clum in, clum in. What word is clum in, people? Come in and just tidy away any of the little outlines where the stencil was. And also for great duplicates coming through. So I've gone silent a minute. I'm actually just concentrating. I do concentrate occasionally. Right, so again, I'm just going to take the worst of that off there. Scrape down the inside of my pot and just put the lid back on so that it doesn't dry out. Um, there are several different um, pastes out there for modelling. Um, that's quite a light bodied one, but I do know there are heavy bodied pastes as well. I haven't found one that I'm actually um, happy with at the moment, but then I don't use heavy bodied paste that often. So let's see if I can just turn this so you can see. So this is what one side looks like. This is what the other, ooh, need to clean that off just slightly more. I don't mind it looking a little aged. I don't want it to look like I've just been lazy. So. So there you go, that's one end. That's the other side. And that's the other end. So hopefully that, that's helpful for you. So right, just clean my palette knife off a little bit. Now I want to come in now. Where's the crackle one? That's the grit. So crackle paste. Okay, if you have crackle paste and you keep it in a jar like this, which is what it comes in, I always, when I'm finished, put a bit of cling film or plastic wrap and press it down to the surface so it's not drying out within the pot. Because, of course, you trap air in there, it's going to cause you more problems. Now, with me, I find I get best results if I do a thinner um, coating of crackle. So I'm just going to come in and I'm literally, I'm just almost palette knife painting. I like I like a thinner look to it. I like, like to just play with it. I don't I don't want perfect. So that's all I'm doing there. I'm not going to leave that bit there though. So I just want that bit to be a little I think I've got something stuck to my palette knife which is causing me an issue. Right by there. There you go. So I've just done a bit of a smear there, just as a little bit of interest. Okay, just a bit, and that will give me interest when I put the paint and the crackle on. If I want, I can come in and do a little bit on the top edge here as well. That's never going to be a problem. So I just give a little bit of a... We're just looking at places that will catch, catch the colour. So I do like doing corners, so we're going to pull this up here. Um, I'm probably doing this a lot thinner than you would do this, actually. I think part of that is because I know if I've got um, a thick coat of crackle paint on my project, there's more chance of it catching on other things and flaking away with the length of time. So there you go. Um, I like to do a little bit on each side, purely because that's the way I like to do it. As I said, random is the best option with this. Let's put a little bit up there. I think I might be doing the crackle on the same corner each time, so I'm going to come over here and add a little bit of crackle there. OK, 
okay and I think I've got one more side to go which is this side and I think I'm going to do it down this corner in here I do love a good crackle paste and I found this Ranger or this Tim Holtz one for me personally works the best um, definitely definitely try as many different ones as you can um, to find your favorite but I know that for me this this is the one I like the best hopefully this is all all visible to you it's a bit tricky so right so I've done that let's just put as I said what I do is I put the plastic wrap or, wrap or cling film on and push it right down inside so that I'm not trapping a pocket of air within the container right let's just wipe my palette knife off again and give you a bit of a view of what we've done so there you go so I've got that along there now you're probably going that's really really white it is really really white but I'm going to be spraying stuff onto this afterwards um, when it's fully dried so as you can see I've got it on the end this is the other side and this is the last end now the very last thing I like to do and I do this in a very specific place I'm using this grit paste again by Ranger purely because it's a grit paste and I'm hoping that the grit will give me the look of corrosion or rust. So I tend to bring it in. So I'm out of camera there. Um, I tend to bring it in and I put it under this edge or along this edge because this is where if there's going to be rust on an item, this is where I imagine it would be it would be catching. And I like to do it along where I've got the crackle paste because that then makes sense of some of the crackle paste. Um, it will look like, oh, that's why it's cracking because it's starting to go rusty. So I, I look at this as if it's rust. And I'm going to do a bit along there as well because otherwise I've got far too much of a straight edge. I'm not so much smoothing as I'm sort of... I am kind of smoothing, but I'm sort of dabbing as well. Um, I might put a little bit down in this corner just as if the corner of this has rusted a bit. a little bit there right and move on to the other side um, do a similar sort of sort of thing here now um, when it comes to um, modeling paste scrackle pastes um, things like that crackle paste modeling paste, and grit paste um, I find it best to let them dry naturally especially when you're using um, stuff like um, crackle paste because the thing is the crackle paste works because the layers are drying at different times within its own medium and if you try to speed that up you will lose the crackle so don't rush crackle paste it's not worth it if you want that really nice crazed crackle look then patience is the name of the game and I'm not the most patient person in the world however it 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 pays you dividends if you can just be a little patience in this this instance. Again, coming in, basically wherever I think rust would catch, it's where I'm going to put this. And try not to smooth it out. Try to let it be a little more chunky, should we say. So, see on the very last side, which is this one. Hopefully I've been in camera for this, guys. I'm trying to look at my palette knife not the ipad screen but then occasionally glance at the ipad screen and correct anything i'm doing movement wise to match what's up there but we'll take a little look in a moment and see what i've come up with okay i think we're done i don't want to go too overboard with it it does add visual texture though right popping this in well it doesn't add visual texture it adds actual texture so so let's have a quick look at this then so this is the first side so i've got the whole rust thing going that's going to look lovely if it crazes up beautifully let's turn this there you go that's another side done and another and another now at this point you are probably going you've ruined it trust me guys 
this is where the magic starts to happen when all those pastes work out. So I now have to leave this overnight. Morning everyone. Okay, we're back. It's been about, ooh, probably about 18 hours since I did um, all of the paste stuff and it's dried and I'm very happy with it. So let's take a look. So here we go. So all of the crackling has happened. As you can see, by doing a really thin layer, I get this really nice crazing. And I like the fact that um, it's quite smooth to the touch. Therefore, it's not likely to flake off. And as I said, I do a thin coat. I mean, down here, can you see there's tiny, tiny little bits of, I don't know if it's going to pick up on that. There's little tiny bits of crazing and all those will actually, um, that crackle will catch any colour that goes into it. Again, here's the texture paste I use, or the grit paste to give me that rusted effect. This is one of the ends. I still haven't worked out or decided which end I'm going to use, but that's one end of it. This is the other side. Again, you can see all of the crackle come through. And I think that's why I like this crackle paste, because I can spread it really thinly. And if I let it dry naturally, I get all these lovely crackles without it standing too proud of the project. So again, the stenciling and that there. And this is the final end, and I really love that bit there. Um, but as you can see, so this is the foundation. So now we get to do the magic bits. Now we get to start doing the colouring. Now, this is where I'm going to struggle slightly because sometimes I'm going to have to be working upside down and on this side of the box. So I'm going to try and do stuff the best I can to let you see what I'm doing. But please forgive me if I can't get it all in shot. So, so first things first, I'm going to add a couple of layers of acrylic paint of stuff that I know I want to capture. Like I've said here, um, with this stuff, I want it to look as if it's it's almost like um, like a copper patina or or that that coloration that's green. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to use some real. It's quite a bright green I'm going to use, and I'm going to come in with this. Hopefully, a bit of a paint goober already in the morning. That's not a good start. Just a little bit of um, that bright green, and I'm going to use some water in it. Just just to soften it back a bit and I'm just going to take just a paintbrush and I'm going to make that a little more liquid because I don't want this to be too painty painty if that's actually a word that I can use but I do want it to be almost like a bit of a wash because there's going to be ink and colour go over the top of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and come in and what I want to do is just catch this bottom edge here. The bit that's under the lip. So I'm just doing that there and as I've got this on hand I'll probably put little bits here and there anyway just to give it more layers of interest should we say. So I'm doing this because um, with this erosion thing that I'm trying to mimic um, I want some brighter sections to it once the darker colours go over the top. So um, the grit paste is okay now, it's fully dried, it's not going to soften back. Um, I'm going to do quite a bit of wet techniques on, on this box and if things do start to soften all I've got to do is just wait for them to dry again. But I don't normally have a problem, so I, do, I don't expect any, let's put it that way. So just coming in here and as with anything um, and this was the reason when I was doing this, I said before, I cannot duplicate the original. Uh, that, that's the whole thing with art, as we know. It's, it's pretty much a one-off. So I'm trying to use the same techniques I used, but it doesn't actually mean I'm going to get the same result. Um, but I'm hoping to get something close to, I mean, interesting texture, and that's all I'm really looking for on this. So right, so I've got I've got the little bits of erosion in. I might put a little bit up there actually. It just looks like it needs it. So let's put that brush to one side. Turn this around. Um, actually, I might not need acrylics anymore. I need to try and think what I need to do. So one of the next things I need to do is I need actually I do need acrylics. There you go. The moment I said it, I knew I said it wrong. Let me just reach for the colour. There it is. I knew it was somewhere. It's this one. So I'm just going to take a bit of this. Sorry, did I just knock you? I apologise. Um, that's that dark turquoise colour again. I'm just going to put a little bit of that on there. 
and I want to make almost a wash out of this. So I've got to get it quite, quite wet. And this was another reason why I said make sure you create a barrier between your box, the paper and um, the stuff we're using because um, there's going to be water. There's there's definitely going to be water involved in this. There's definitely going to be wet mediums. Um, as you can see, I'm really not, really, really not caring where I put this. I'm just, I'm just putting it where I feel I want to build up this illusion on these edges. Just, there's going to be inks over the top of this. There's probably going to be sprays on top of this as well. Um, if you do not have, um, inks or sprays you can water down acrylic and put it into a spritz bottle and that that will give you something that will spray that will give you a similar effect so have i done that side no i haven't so i'll show you one in a minute because i've got i've got one that i made myself before i found the color teal okay let's put that to one side that to one side that to one side so let's put this to one side a second so let me just show you. So this is just a spritz bottle and if you go to your dollar store or your pound store you'll find in the travel aisle you've usually got these packs that are maybe two of these, a couple of little bottles, a little container. I just get those. I put a little tiny bit of acrylic in here, fill it up to about here with water and then have a go spraying it and then see whether you need to add more water or less water. So let me just show you what that looks like. So I've got a bit of just regular paper here. There you go. So I've got it. It's not going to give me a fine mist, um, but it does give me that effect. And then I can come in afterwards with water and mist it. And then I can get the movement that I probably would with ink. OK, just just know that there is an alternative if you don't have inks or stuff on the go. So let's move this out of the way before I put my hand in it. So let's just... Sorry, I'm going to get messy if I put that somewhere I know. I just need to put it in the bin so it's out of my hand as well. So, right. So now this is all on here. I'm going to come in with some inks. Now, the two inks I kind of like using is there's a Liquitex acrylic ink, which is deep turquoise. And there's this Ranger one, which is an acrylic ink, which is called um, an alcohol ink, which is called Stream. This one is slightly bluer and this one's slightly greener. So I'm probably going to be using both of these as I go along. OK, so just so you know, I give them a good shape because there are particles in there. I don't know whether you can see the difference in colour there. You'll see it more when I use it. So I'm going to use the acrylic one first. Um, the Liquitex acrylic one. If I can get the lid off it. So it's quite it's quite a bright color and i like that about it so i'm going to come in i'm just going to draw the odd bit of a line on some of these areas put the lid back on because goodness knows if anyone's going to knock anything over it's me and then i'm going to come in and i'm going to spritz this with water a reasonable amount of water because what I want it to do is I want it to be able to run, but I don't know if you can see it there. It'll go into all the little nooks and crannies. So just going to let that run down the side of the box. I'll periodically lift this up so you can see all of the movement happening on here. Now I'm going to do more to this side. So I just want to make sure that you've seen that. I am then going to blot off some of this that I don't want it so dark, but I did want some of that movement. I'm going to do that on each of the sides. Um, some more, some less. They don't all have to be um, as dark or as much as that one side. The secret is water. And the other secret, as I said, is actually having a barrier. And, and play with the way the water runs and the inks run throughout your design. So, as I said, I'm sorry I have to put this up this way to make it work. So, as you can see... All that lovely crazing is coming through here and of course I'm getting all over my fingers because that's 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 makes media for you all right sit that up a second just so I wipe my hands and let everything else drip down um you can at this point 
um, use a heat tool if you wanted to, or I usually use a hairdryer to be honest. Um, I sometimes find a heat tool is a little bit too fierce for what I'm looking for. So let's turn this again. Same process. We'll get it in into that grit paste that I put there. I'm going to put a handsome, a handsome, what am I talking about? A reasonable line there because I know I've got all of this beautiful stuff here and I want that to move around. I love this when this happens. See, it all just powers down into that. Now, obviously, I'm on my mucky mat here, which is exactly where I need to be for this process uh, because it will drip. It will run. You, you're going to have to keep clean up. Um, have it on a surface that you can clean, have it on a surface you can wipe. And if you need to wear gloves, wear gloves. I mean, I don't because people are used to seeing me walking around with funny colour hands. So again, I'm going to just take off the excess of this. Now, um, some of these acrylic inks and some of these sprays will look really intense. But when they dry out um, or when they dry, they dry paler. OK, just just be aware that you're not always going to get what you're seeing on the first first time of doing this. I put some there because I want it to run through that. And I think that's probably going to be enough of this. This does come in several different colours, by the way, um, and a little bit goes a very long way. So just be aware that's one of those. Um, and any inks will work. I would just say make sure that if you're using something that's alcohol based and you're going to spritz it with water, um, you need to work reasonably quickly because if the alcohol ink has already dried, you're not going to get it to activate again um, if you spritz it with water. I suppose you could spritz it with um, maybe isopropyl alcohol. I've not done that, so I'm not really familiar whether that works, but it, it would be an idea. So I've started the box off now. So as you can see, it's starting to dry on this side, which is the original side, and it's starting to dull back a bit. Well, just dabbing the excess off because Yes, I like the runs. I like everything on here. I just don't want it to be too much of all of the runs and stuff. I just want bits on here. We will be doing a bit of um, a white spray in a little while as well, just to mute all of this back a little bit further. And then at that point, I'll then decide whether I need to put anything else into it. So, and I've, obviously we've got that stream color I talked about. So as you can see, it's coming into its own now. We're getting that really, that's where the secret of this comes from. Now, if you wanted to add other colors, you can do. I mean, have I got another one here? I mean, this is yellow oxide. Sometimes if I want to lighten up something, um, I'll put this into it. Um, actually, should we put some of this into it? I hadn't planned on it, but let's let's do a little bit of this and just see see what effect we can get. I don't want a lot. Just maybe a bit here and there, just to add a little bit of variety to this. Just to see, see how that feels as it runs. Maybe it'll give it a slightly goldish feel. There you go, it's just added a hint of. I don't mind that actually, that's actually quite cool. I'll do that on all the sides I feel. Just a little bit more down here, I think, because this area needs something. And if I'm doing it on one area, I might as well do it on the other areas. Um, a bit more of a spritz. I have a feeling I may be running out of water shortly. So we may have to do a bit of a, a little bit of a break while things get refilled. So again, I'm just going to take the majority of it back off, but it's all about adding those colors, add, adding those layers. Now, if I hadn't have um, put Mod Podge on or a barrier, I would not be in a happy place at the moment because this would all be moving all over the place and the box would be rippling and we'd be in a whole world of pain. Why am I shaking the water bottle? Good grief. We 
and it's a little bit on this last side doesn't need much I just want a touch on here and that's that's the um, yellow oxide so my aim was just to give us something that may have looked ever so slightly like um, gold because we're going to be using a metallic in here eventually anyway and that might just oh I forgot where it is and that might help so I give this a bit of a chance to run okay so where are we up to let's flip this this way so this is what we're looking like so far. You can, of course, dry out your kitchen paper and use it on other things, uh, maybe collage, stuff like that. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause you for a second, just while I get the old hairdryer out on this, because I want to put another layer on here in a few minutes. Or actually, do I want to put it on now? Maybe now, actually, because then I can do the last layer. Right, so I'm using um, Picket Fence. It's a Distress Spray Ink by, again, by Tim Holtz Ranger. And this, this sprays quite, quite wildly. I shall, oh, I dropped the kitchen roll. Um, it sprays all over the place. So I know that it's going to give me more coverage than I need. I could do splatters. Actually, I could do splatters. Okay, let's see if I can do splatters and get the same effect as what I want. So I'm just going to come out. Oh, I can do it. Okay. So I'm going to come out and I'm just tapping this down. Just to give this some splatters. And these splatters will move around. Um, the only trouble with doing splatters and things like this is you don't really have a heck of a lot of control as to where they go. So, uh, my dear sprays, you don't have a heck of a lot of control either. So I'm just going to do the same again up here. This, of course, could be um, white acrylic paint. It could be, you could even get a white Posca pen and and shake that over the top and you can get splatters from that as well. I can see my desk is going to need a big old clean up because I've now got white splatters everywhere. But this will... Um, almost wick out it'll it'll bleed into the other colors it'll it'll give me some really really nice interest let's put the lid on that I've got paint everywhere okay let's turn this one over so this is how it's beginning to develop let's develop on this side loving that that's lovely it'll dull back it will absorb other colors through same on here, it will absorb out and take other colours through. If you wanted to spray it, you could with water. Again, go let that sit for a while. And that's the other end. So I am now going to pause you. We'll actually go ahead and get the hairdryer and dry this off until I do the last little bits of colouring. So we're back again. I've given us about probably no more than a five minute blast with a hairdryer just to drive off any excess moisture from this. Um, as you can see, we've now got this. As you can see, it really does dull back a little bit. So I'm going to come in now with that stream, that stream alcohol ink. Now, this is just the final touches, to be honest. Um, this is up to you whether you do it or not. I like this colour um, and I like the intensity it gives, but I'm not, I'm not hugely liberal with this because I don't want it to dominate. Um, I'm just putting it in certain places. on this it's probably not going to run unless I add liquid to it so there you go actually it might run just a little bit by there so I'm going to let that sit now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work my way around the box doing this it did run a little bit but I think I just want to hit that with oh, I'm running out of water I should oh no I didn't take it so give it a little bit more just gives it another level of intensity so I'm going to turn this around and do a little bit on here. By spritzing it, I'm actually softening the edges of ink as well. So if you've got hard edges like I've got there, I didn't realise I had that to be honest. I've run out of water. I've got another spritz bottle to my side. 
So just bringing the intensity back into that color. Now the ink is likely to stay more intense than um, the acrylic ink did. Okay, just, just so you know, it, it does tend to keep keep its color better, or I find it does anyway. Personal choice, but there you go. Personal finding, should I say. Sit a second, see if I can find that other water bottle. There you go, that's the other water bottle. Obviously, note to self, have more water on hand, that's better. That's what I'm trying to get at. So, let it run down. A little bit more here. I want that to come down to there. And a little bit there, because that's a bit too green for me. Again, hit it with some water and let it do its thing. So, um, that's pretty much me done for um, the wet techniques on here. So here we are, we've got this, it's dry to the touch. I, I don't know that it would be dry all the way through at this point, but it's definitely dry to the touch. And um, we're gonna do some black splatters on here, but I had forgotten one stage, which is the next stage, thank goodness. I, at least I didn't forget it too late. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use some gilding wax. Um, this is, what is this called? Um, can't remember the color of this. I want to say it's antique gold or something like that. I can never find the names on these things. Oh wait, it's there. Antique gold. Okay, so a gilding wax, to me it's a bit like a shoe polish to be honest with you. It's that sort of consistency and you put it on with your fingers. Now, if you haven't got access to that but you've got metallic paints, you could use the same technique with a dry brushing technique with them. So what you do is I put a little bit on my fingers and then I just come over and I want to just catch some of the raised texture on here. So I'm not, I'm not covering the whole thing, but I am, see that's what I'm looking for, where it just catches, catches pieces. Now it's, it's got a sort of waxy feel to this. Um, but it does, once it's fully dried, I've never had a problem with it coming off again. Um, it's just, just stuff I use. It comes in a couple of golds. It does come in um, silver as well. Um, there's a few different colours. And there, there are a few different brands out there as well. So this is just gilding wax, guys. Um, it's, I just like using it. it. It gives me that really nice... Let's just, I'll lift that up to you a bit. So as you can see, it gives me that really nice metallic finish to it. Just gives it that little bit of interest. I mean, I can be quite addicted to you doing this technique. I mean, I, I, I will end up with far too much on if I don't, if I don't control myself. So, cause I just love the way it looks. This, this will just enhance that whole corrosion feel I was looking for. I mean, you could use the silver. You could you could actually use a couple of different colours on, on one. Um, I, I want to stay with this antique gold because the other one, the other boxes I've done was were made with antique gold. And I'd like to keep... I don't want them all to look the same, but they, they look as if they're in the... Whoops, nearly dropped it. They look as if they're in the same sort of family if I've got them... Um, in the same group of colours. So there you go, as you can see, I've got that on there. And this side. I must admit, when I first heard of gilding waxes, I, I had no idea what the heck they were. Um, I saw them first used on the craft show and I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I like those. But then once I bought, bought my first pot of them, I, I was addicted. Um, I love the way they just add that. That ability to raise texture to another level, I think that's probably the way I want to use it. Um, there may be other products out there that do the same thing. I'm just, I'm just not overly familiar with them, as I said. So I want a bit of this down here, just to give that a bit more shading. And I run it along a lot of the edges you may be seeing. Um, because that's just the points of interest for me. So again, 
There you go, added bits to that. And the last side, I still haven't decided which of these ends is going to be my front, so I have to make that decision shortly as well. I hope this has been what you were expecting, guys. I mean, I, as you heard me say at the beginning of part one, I wasn't really sure how I was going to, I want to say remake, but redo the original box, um, because the trouble is having the space to actually do it. So I know I've done this side, but I want a little bit more on here, I feel. So I think that's it for the gilding wax, says he merrily, adding more gilding wax. So I think we're going to stop with the gilding wax there because if not, Kerry will have a problem. Um, I'll have gilding wax on absolutely everything and I won't be able to do anything about it. So have a closer look. So this is now what this side of the box looks like. Um, sorry, this is going to be really close because I know it's the end of the box. This is what the other side looks like. And this is what the other end looks like. And I'm not sure whether this is going to be my front or this is going to be my front. Unsure at the moment. Um, I don't know that I'm leaning to any or other. Right, so we're going to come up with some splatters in black. So I'm just using regular black acrylic paint. As I said, you could be using ink. You could be using, um, I don't know, you could use so many things for this. Um, and also I don't want a lot. Uh, there's the black will give this dimension um, it'll give it that that dramatic feel I'm looking for but you can take it far too far right I'm using a fan brush you don't need to use a fan brush I just normally use a fan brush you can do it with any brush you want just make sure that the the medium you're putting on is reasonably fluid I mean you, you want to make sure that it will actually come off the paintbrush, that's crazy, it's nice. So, right, but you don't want so much on the brush, it's gonna cause you a problem either. So, take some of that off there. So literally, what I do is I hold my finger and then I'll tap onto my finger. Because if I just tap from here, the, sp the splats go upwards. So that's enough on that side. So I've gone silent because I'm actually concentrating at this point. <laughs> so there are certain areas I really like to put the splats on. I think I've just splatted my curtains as well at the moment. So a little bit, bit too vigorous on the splattering, I think. And the last side, oh, that really did splatter, didn't it? Oh, I didn't mean to do that. So I've got splatters on here. I might actually put one or two on the inside just to carry that through because we haven't done anything else on the inside. I think I need more water in that. I might just put a few on the inside, as I said, just to give me a little bit more interest on the inside. And I might catch some of the top edges at the same time. So, okay, right. Um, I would say now that the painting and the colouring of this are now done. But next thing I need to do, and this is one of my favourite things to do, is I want to put the nameplate on. Now I'm using one of these. I don't know what they're called. Draw plates, nameplate. I use these quite a bit, and I need to decide now which is the end I want it on. It's going to go up here. Um, that's quite nice. Well, I think I do like that end, even though that was the end I wasn't going to use. But yeah, I think I've ended up liking that end. So I want to put this on here. Now, there's something I do um, to attach these. I could just glue this on. But to be honest with you, I want it to be looking a little bit more authentic than that. So I'll show you what I do is 
we had a double thickness of card here. Now, you may remember when I did the part one, I did say I wanted the double thickness for support and another reason. And the other reason is these little nameplates come with tiny little screws. I'm not sure you're going to be able to see that. However, if I screw that into there, it's probably going to stick through just the other end. So what I do is I take a little pair of um, wire cutters and I cut off the end of the screw. I'm going to do this over my bin because I don't want my dog coming in here and finding a bit of metal. So all I've done is just cut the very end off and I'm going to do that on both of them. And what that will do is that means that it will actually that was a bit harder than the other one. It does mean that when I screw it in, it's not going to come through the other side of the box. Um, now, I'm going to put it on this end, obviously. Well, not obviously, I'm going to. I'm using a white gel pen for this next bit, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, just make sure it works on the back of my hand. It does. However, me being me, I really do want to make sure this is as central as I can get it. Everything has to be measured. So I just want to make sure, and I don't mind it just fractionally off, so that's seven in a little bit. So we'll probably come over a little bit. Make that seven and a half. That's about seven and a half. Okay, I will live with that. Right, so I've got that in place. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold that with my thumb. Just make sure I didn't move that. Not that much. And I'm gonna come in with my white gel pen and I'm gonna put a mark onto the box. And I want the mark there so I can actually see with everything that's going on where I need to put the screws. So there go tiny little dots, but they are there. Now, because I've taken the ends off my screws, I'm going to use a pokey tool and I'm going to push this in just to give myself, sorry, the back of my hand is covering anything, just to give myself a start of where um, the screws are going to go into. I don't go all the way through. I just put enough of a hole to get the screws started. If I have a little bump on the other side, I can just press it my fingers, it'll go flat. Now, um, this will be screwed in place, but I like to have a little bit of a security note here. So I'm gonna put a bit of art glitter glue into the hole, so it'll grip the screw. And I'm also gonna put a bit of art glitter glue on here and here and just run a little bit of a line along here. It's probably not gonna be gripping to anything, but it's just that security measure I like to put into place. Let's put the top on that. Then this is the tricky bit because I've got some big hands and we've got a camera over the top of us and this is gonna be the tricky bit for me. So trying to line those back up with the holes. Hopefully I did that correctly. Now trying to get the screws in. Oh, I didn't get the screwdriver, did I? Well, there you go, what a numpty I am. So I'm just going to sit these into the hole. Sit this into the hole. Let's see if I can reach the screws. I've got a little set of screwdrivers here. Um, and this is this is what I use. I, I, I don't know whether this is for model making, for glasses, spectacles, whatever. I've had it absolutely... Well, I can't even tell you how long I've had it. I've just had it most of my life. So as far as I'm concerned, they've always been there. Um, so I just use this. You've probably got a small screwdriver somewhere. As I said, if you've got a pair of spectacles or a spectacle repair kit, you'll probably find there's a screwdriver in there that will do it. Just want to dab off the little bits of glue either side. Now, that gives me the nameplate on the end. Now, let's see if I can... Um, let's see if I can pull over the other one. I'm going to pull over the little one at the moment, not the big one, because I can't get it under the screen. But as I said, this is the one I'm working on. As you can see, you can put any sort of label in there. Now, I favour using Tracy Fox's labels because she has some wonderful digitals and she does a huge amount of small labels you can do. I can't remember, because this is the one I favoured. I can't remember what this file is and um, what this digital download is called. It's not called Field Notes. I want to say it's called something else. So what I'll do is, once I've started editing this, in that corner you'll see a gravy. I will try and hunt down the 
um, the digital I used and actually put the link to Tracy Fox's um, shop within that. So if you do want to, and there's a huge amount of labels on the sheets, guys, and I literally fussy cut them out and use them. Um, and ironically, this is almost perfectly the right size to slip into there. However, I do want to put some glue on the back of this so that it's in place and it's in place forever. I don't need to change this. I suppose I could go in and actually put a label of what's actually in here, like tags or journals. But I think as there's no lid on this box, I don't need to be that pedantic about it. So I'm just going to lift that up. Now, art glitter glue likes to work quite quickly. So because I've got big fat hands, I'm going to just bring this in. So I need to just see if that's central. Down a little bit further at the ends. There you go, and that's just finished the front of that box off. Now I'm just going to turn this over while that's drying. And as I said before, I'm going to put some of these um, felt dots on the, the base just so they've got some feet. I like to put one in each corner. What's wrong with this glue? I have a blockage. Come on, how you come? There you go, that's one. Two, three, and of course I've got threads going across all of the bottom of this now. I will tidy those up afterwards. And I will just come in, as I said, these are sticky, but I do know that as I take boxes in and out of the shelf, sometimes the little feet will end up coming off. I mean, they're inexpensive little tabs so I don't expect them to be absolutely perfect for the job and which is why I put a little bit of the fabric tack on the bottom but those will hold it I mean they they've not come off on me ever before once I've glued them in so there you go so that's that hi guys I know handheld isn't perfect but this is the best way I can do this to show you a little more of the detail of this without it being so close to you so bear with me there's only so much I can do in my little craft cave. And I'm really pleased how that turned out, actually. I love the way that gilding wax catches the light. Sorry, gilding wax catches the light. So there you go. Um, I love it. I hope you do too. And I'll see you for the next project. Bye-bye now.